Good evening, everybody. I'm Dertricia Rollins, the Assistant Director of CARES Circle, the nonprofit programming arm of CARES Books and More, the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. And I'm so glad that you chose to spend your Friday evening with us, where you should absolutely be. Um, tonight's event is co-hosted by the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American Culture and History, who will be providing supplementary resources in the chat. Please know that they will stay there. The chat will be available after the conversation and you can come back for them later. I would like to introduce tonight's guest, Brian Broom, in conversation with Deisha Filial for a celebration of Punch Me Up to the Gods, a poetic and raw coming of age memoir about blackness, masculinity, and addiction. If you have a question for the panel, please put them in the ask a question box at the bottom center of your screen. If you see a question that you like that someone else has already asked, you can upvote it to make sure it gets seen. Now, Brian Groom is an award-winning writer, poet, and screenwriter, and K. Leroy Irvis Fellow and instructor in the writing program at the University of Pittsburgh, where he is pursuing an MFA. He has been a finalist in the Moss Storytelling Competition and won a grand prize in Carnegie Mellon University's Martin Luther King Writing Awards. Deisha Filial's debut so short story collection, The Secret Lives of Church Ladies, focuses on Black women, sex, and the Black church which was nominated for and won many well-deserved prizes. Her work has been listed as notable in the Best American Essay series, and her writing on race, parenting, gender, and culture has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and many other publications. Please welcome Brian and Deisha. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trisha. Dr. Trisha. So, yeah. Brian, mm. I'm gonna start by saying nice things. Good. Thank okay. You. So I'm very proud of you. Thank you. I love you. I love I'm you glad too. you're my friend. I'm Thank actually you. having to read the notes because I wrote this down. <laughs> I am glad you're my friend. <clears throat> no, truly. I'm thrilled that your book is in the world. Um, it exhausted me to read it because I wanted to reach into the pages and hug young you and old you. Um, and because it made my heart heavy for all the young Bryans and all the young Twans. Um, and for those who haven't read the book, Twan is a young boy that uh, Brian writes about throughout the book. But ultimately, I just came back to the fact that you survived and that you are surviving. And that makes me really happy. Thank you. I'm not going to be nice anymore after this. Yeah, I figured it was going to. So thank you for that brief moment of time. <laughs> that I shall never be able to relive. Like, thank you, I appreciate so, it. So, you know, so these events are always special. Um, and we talked about this in the green room that when you do it with a friend, it just makes it extra special. Um, and one of the things that your friends can do that somebody else can't do is tell a story about you. Uh, so I have, um, but no. Yeah. So, you like this story. So I want first I want everybody to note how beautiful Brian's skin is looking right now. He is wearing Fenty Beauty. Yes. And um Brian's first Fenty Beauty purchase, I was there for. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Brian was getting some award of one of his many, and I was gonna be his plus one. So we decided to go shopping at the mall. I hate the mall, but for Brian, I went to the mall to find a dress for me and something for him. We didn't know what, and makeup. We both needed makeup. So um, Brian decided as we we're entering the mall that he wanted to experience what it felt like to be perceived as heterosexual. Because of course that never happens for him. And so we tried it. And so we're walking through the mall and the first thing he tried to do was put his arm around me. And it was like, I don't even know. And I was like, no, that's not how, how, how that works. So then he tried to hold my hand and it was like, you know how, have you ever like picked up spaghetti with like the, the spaghetti thing? Like imagine just this. So no, that didn't work. So we get to the first store and I'm trying on dresses and, and Brian's being like super helpful and he's like super chatty with all the salespeople and we leave the store and um, Brian's like, I think I, I think they believe that we were a couple. I think they were convinced. I, and I said, no, I think what they were saying to themselves is 
I wonder if that woman knows that her husband's gay. <laughs> That's what I think the impression was that they got. So then we went to a couple more stores and I was just, you remember, I was not, con you seemed convinced that I was people convinced. were convinced. Yeah. And then I, like we were in one store and you're like, how do you, why do you think this guy wasn't convinced? And I said, because you flirted with him, Brian. <laughs> that might've been his clue that we weren't actually together. So <laughs> it's never a dull moment with you um, ever. And that's just one of many stories, but um, I'm gonna get to some questions about you and punch me up to the gods. Um, tonight, and all of my questions are going to be loaded, so I just want you Fair to enough. I'm ready for you. I'm ready. know that up front. Okay, so one thing I know about you is that you want people to think well of you, you want them to adore you, pay homage, all of that, but at the same time, you want to be left the hell alone. Yep. You <laughs> like being at your house, yep. it's like pulling teeth to get you to come to my house, even before the pandemic. And yet writing a book and then talking about that book for at least a year afterwards is like one of the most public things that a person could do. Um, so what made you want to do this and how did you get past your own, get past yourself and your resistance to actually write it and put it out in the world? Ooh, I mean, uh, you know, I've been telling people like a lot of this, a lot of writing this was, it comes out of recovery. As you know, okay. I'm, I'm recovering. Um, it comes from, you know, I started this book in rehab, like, you know, I started writing these stories in rehab and it was just sort of part of my recovery journey. And as I was writing it, you know, and I wanted, there were times when I wanted to stop and there were times when I wanted to not, um, you know, put certain things in or, leave, you know, leave things out. And I would ask myself, well, you know, how badly do you want to stay sober? You know, mm. um, this, this, you know, I, uh, uh, I've said this before, but there's a saying in recovery, like you're only as sick as your secrets. Um, and so I thought, well, if I put these things that I'm pretty sensitive about, you know, into this book, you know, maybe I will get better. You know, maybe I can sort of lean on sobriety as a, as a rock, you know, um, mm -hmm. in telling these stories. So it did kind of get me over, you know, because I don't want to be that person anymore. You know, and that's, and it's really odd because you're one of the few friends that I have that has never seen me drunk, like has never seen me high, has never seen me drunk. There are a lot of people out there who have, you know, a lot of people who still, you know, if I would approach them in public, they would run the other way. So I want to remain this person. Um, and writing this book was uh, a tool to help me remain this person and to try to become a better person. So that's what that's what fueled it, I think. Okay. And then how did you come to weave it into it, the Gwendolyn Brooks poem, We Real Cool, which I absolutely love that poem. And when I used to teach fifth grade, I used to teach it to white suburban kids in Greenwich, Connecticut. <laughs> so right. it was really special to me that, uh, you know, to see when you chose that poem. So what was it about that poem? Um, when I read that poem, you know, I mean, first of all, it's Gwendolyn Brooks. It's beautifully constructed. It's, it's you know, it was unlike any poem that I had ever read before. But what struck me immediately was I was like, she's talking about masculinity. She's talking about specifically black masculinity. The story um, mm -hmm. behind the poem being that you know, she was walking down the street and she saw these boys, um, you know, in this pool hall and they were doing very, you know, adult things. Mm -hmm. uh, and those things that they were doing, the lines of the poem, like just reminded me of, you know, things from my youth, you know. Um, of having to be cool and, you know, and the attitudes towards school and, um, you know, staying out late, that whole thing, you know, I had done all of it, but to what end, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I just started questioning my own experiences around, you know, being black and being male. And I thought that I was a, a damn genius because I was like, she's talking about masculinity and nobody else sees yes. that. It's just me. I'm a fucking <laughs> genius, right? And then of course I found Bell Hooks had wrote a whole fucking book about it. Like, <laughs> and I was like, damn it, Bell Hooks. Damn it. <laughs> so, but then I read Bell Hooks book, you know, mm -hmm. and I got, I gleaned more from, you know, her writing. And it's like, you know, when you, I mean, when you read Bell Hooks, you really gotta like, you gotta knuckle down. Um, yeah. 
And so I was like, well, you know, I can't do this. I can't do this, you know, in-depth intellectual examination of masculinity. So I'll just tell my little stories, you know, and see how that works. And um, fortunately it works. You know. We work very well. Um, speaking of, you know, your discovery of bell hooks and, and just the, your trajectory around writing and publishing is considered non-traditional. Um, you came to it later in life. Um, you also experienced a lot of success and acceptance on the front end of your career, which is the opposite from what most of us experience. And so, you know, when you've experienced rejection, it's after a lot of acceptance and not the other way around. And I know from the time when you thought our friendship was over because I didn't love something that you wrote. Uh, which still cracks me up. Mean stories. You're just gonna stay telling them. Yes, please go on. I just it's just, it's a bridge. It's a bridge. But um, you know, you didn't. I mean, and and I wasn't even rejecting the story as much as I thought it was two writers talking. And I was like, eh, you know, I, I'm not really feeling this part. I'm concerned about this. And and I was very specific about my concerns. But I felt like, and we've talked about the fact that you felt like it was a rejection of you, but I yeah. also felt like you had that reaction because you've experienced so much success early on and you hadn't weathered the rejection that a lot of writers get and then the acceptance comes. So how have you been, how do you navigate rejection, failure, those kinds of things given you know how your career has gone so far? Well, I want to push back on that a little bit because, like, okay. when when you said like I did, you weren't really feeling it. Like it, like for me, and because of I think my background uh, in wanting you know people to love me or whatever. Like when you said you didn't like it, I, it was wholly about you. I was like, she hates me. You know, I thought it was a rejection of me. Um, you know, and it it was it was personal. I was like, how could she? not like this or how could she tell me you know i wasn't able to separate the friendship mm -hmm. you know from the writing um and you know you know that's that's something that i've had to work through on you know on the level that you asked like you know i don't know i mean i'm destined to fail i know that we all are you know i i don't know how you know i'm gonna be able to to take that that you know I've had things, you know, I, and I'm so sensitive about it too. Like I've had things rejected and been like, well, they don't know. They just don't know what a fucking genius I am. You know, just really <laughs> like the, clearly this is racism, homophobia, <laughs> sexism. And the rest of us are like, well, it's Tuesday. Yeah, exactly. I'm you like, know, and you're on to the next thing. <laughs> everything is anti-Semitic. That's why they don't like my writing, you know, but you know, I think it's just something that I'm going to have to learn. You know, I've, I've taken, you know, I've, I mean, and I'm, and I am learning it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I've worked with a very, uh, a stickler of an editor, um, who is very exacting about what works and what doesn't work. I, and I've had to learn how to take, you know, criticism and I've had to, you know, I've had to hear people say, well, I just don't like it. So I'm getting, I'm getting better at it. You know, it, there's no, you know, you can't be all that sensitive out here if you're going to write things. If you're going to produce any form of art, you can't. You know, you got to just keep doing what it is that you do and 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 uh, do it the best way you can. So that's what I look forward to going forward. So let's get into the book. Um, so as far as my favorite essays in the book, there's a tie. And the first one, my first favorite is the chapter chapter in which you take on your mother's voice and you write from her point of view. So can you talk a bit about how you developed that essay? Um, did you interview her? How did it all come together? First, I had to tell her that you and I are not a couple. <laughs> <laughs> and then she was not speaking to you for a while. My mother thought Disha was going to be, she had, she held out the last heterosexual hope. Like when I started talking about Disha, she baked Disha a whole ass pie. It was a sweet potato pie. So. Yes. A black woman bakes you a sweet potato pie. She's trying yes. to make you her daughter-in-law or you're trying to be her daughter-in-law if you bake the pie. So right. that's the significance of this pie. So I had to tell that woman, look, I'm not, this is not my future bride. We just, I'm still gay as Christmas. 
Um, <laughs> but no, like seriously, like I, I, um, I, uh, I did interview her. Mm -hmm. I asked her if I could interview her. Um, I, and to my surprise, you know, my mother's not a really, uh, not a real outgoing woman. She's very shy and she's very, um, reserved. Um, uh, she loved Jesus. Um, and she doesn't want to, you know, and, and throughout my whole life, we hadn't really talked about those things. And, you know, I told her what I was doing. I asked her, you know, this microphone that I'm talking into right now, like I literally like stuck it in her face and I interviewed her. Um, and I asked her, you know, very specific questions for which she gave answers that were not entirely like emotional. She just sort of gave me facts. Um, and she did say some things that, you know, I, in, in that moment, I really did feel closer to her. So I took the facts that she gave me um, and I tried to like think, okay, how would I feel, you know, if I were her, you know? Um, so I tried to extrapolate what emotions, you know, she might be feeling going through this time in her life. Um, and, you know, I was very, very nervous about that. Um, because she could have been like, you got it all wrong. Like I, I wasn't feeling any of this shit, you know, but she read it. She is pleased with it. Um, she, I, you know, she got the book. She told me she wasn't going to read the book at all, but she got it. And then two days later, I got a text, you know, one of those old boomer texts book good, you know, <laughs> It was like all she could manage to text was like, red book, it good. You know, I'm like, all right, Frankenstein, I'm just going to call you up. <laughs> so I call her ass up and I was like, okay, so you read the book. And she was like, yeah, it's it's beautiful. I think you, I'm very proud of you. She told me she had to skip over some parts where I was being nasty. <laughs> which is like, what, three, half four? The book. So basically your mom read half the book. <laughs> She read her chapter and that was fucking it. She was like, I'm out. No, but she said she, you know, she read most of it and we had a really great talk. And, you know, this book, one of the things it's done that I'm really grateful for is that it is it has brought me closer to my mom, you know, mm -hmm. from whom I was estranged, you know, because of my problems, my addictions, you know, um, and because I didn't understand where she was coming from. And now I do. And you are obligated to come to lunch with us. This, I uh, I can't wait to come to lunch. Yeah, with you okay. all. I'm just yeah. gonna we're just gonna keep keep her expectations low. We're gonna manage her expectations. So don't touch me. <laughs> she will <holler. laughs> That's oh, it's gonna be so hard not to touch you. God. So, uh, before I tell you my next favorite essay, since we're talking about you know something that's happened for you since the book came out, you feel closer to her, and um, how else has um, talking about the book changed you, changed how you feel about yourself, about the book? Because I find that being on a book tour, I discovered things, even though I was asked the same questions a lot, in the in the answering of those questions over time, that I had some aha moments. Did you have, have you had any? I mean, I know you just literally started, but. Um, no, I don't have okay. nothing to learn out here. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, I don't know if I don't know if if talking about it since it's come out and and since it's been uh, out there, I think the one thing that I've learned not so much in like you know interviews and things like that, or that is that you know I'm maybe I'm maybe a little bit stronger than I give myself credit for. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have lived my life in a very fearful way. Um, you know, when you are an addict, you are afraid of a lot of stuff. Um, you're mm -hmm. you're afraid of things that you don't want to face. Um, you know. Uh, maybe life in general gives you anxiety. Um, and I really thought for a time, like, you know, these are things that I'm going to just never talk about, you know, mm -hmm. but I think that, you know, in learning how to deal with criticism and learning how to, um, you know, uh, confront these things, you know, and things about myself, you know, um, that I'm probably, I, I may be a little bit stronger than I give myself credit for at times. And uh, maybe I'm capable, maybe I'm capable of more than I give myself credit for at times. Like this book, like, you know, if you had asked me, you know, not very long ago, like if I thought I would have a book in the world, I would have said you were insane. I can't write a book. You know, I can't teach a class, you know, I can't go to Europe, you know, I can't, you know, all these things that I have done. So I think the process itself is proving to me that, you know, maybe I should 
take a few more risks and, and, and I'm, I'm actually up to challenges. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's the thing, like I've always seen you as very capable and I've always tried to be respectful when you're, when you tell me that you're afraid of something or that you're anxious about something and, and honor how you feel, but I'm always looking at you like you can do anything. Yeah. You can do anything. I you feel, know? you know, I feel at times, you know, the end of the book, the word, the last word in the book, I think is limitless. I mm -hmm. feel that way a lot of the time these days. Mm -hmm. Um, and just try things and don't be afraid to fail at them and don't be afraid of what people say and don't, yeah. you know, I mean, you're one of the biggest, you're one of the biggest people who's taught me that. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I don't want to quote what you said because uh, I came to you one time and I, I was upset about something that somebody oh. said. Yeah. <sighs> you said fuck them niggas, basically. Uh, <laughs> Did it I mean, help though? Did it, did it absolutely help? Okay. I was just like, I, I mean, I came to you and I was just like, oh, blah, blah, blah. I gave you this long speech about how I was feeling ambivalent and scared, and then you answered me with three words: "Fuck them niggas." And I was like, well, shit. Okay. Well, I guess fuck them niggas. <laughs> Same thing with Paris. I was like, you're going to go to Paris. You're going to be fine. You're going to have a little romance. And you did. See? Ooh, you're, not not supposed to tell that. you're not supposed to tell that. Why? I, don't, I ain't put that out there. Okay. Well, next question. It wasn't a romance. So, exact. See? I think we both know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my next favorite essay is... Oh, gosh, it was so hard. The one about your mother and her friends seeing Luther Vandross on TV for the first time. And I am i won't give away the spoilers because that chapter needs to be read without any. Um, it was absolutely gutting. And um, was this cha was that chapter or any of the others harder for you to write than, you know, is there's one that stands out? Um, you know, I think there were I mean, when, when I all of them were hard to write. <laughs> Um, okay. You know, that chapter, because when I was writing it, all I did was listen to Luther Vandross, um, mm. you know, and that really put me in the, in a place, you know, particularly, um, you know, uh, uh, don't you remember you told me you love me, baby? Superstar. Like, superstar. Thank you. I couldn't remember the name of it. Like I was listening to that and it just, it brought me back to that feeling that I had that night. You know, I remember, you know, in the middle of this like joyous occasion or what started out as a joyous occasion, I remember feeling, I, you know, you know, I should just die. I should die right now, you know, um, because this is all there is. So yeah, that was a particularly hard chapter to write, you know. Um, and what's crazy about those things, you know, uh, is that people don't remember it. My sister remembers that night, you know, mm -hmm. but like nobody else, I mean, it was just a blip. It wasn't even a blip on anybody else's yeah. radar. And I was having like this transformative moment, you know? Um, yeah. So that one was hard to write. I think look left, look right was hard to write as well because, um, you know, I think that was one of my, you know, when I go to the doctor, um, I think yeah. that was one of my rock bottom moments, um, you know, that went on for a long time. So. They were all difficult to write in different ways, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's each 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 uh, you know chapter took me back to a different place um, in my life that I either regret or I now know what that mean what it means. Right. Do you have a favorite um, essay in the collection? <laughs> Pussy math, um, <laughs> which is not about me. Yeah, that's, there's been some that rumors flying around that that chapter is about De Shafilia. I want to clear the record and say it is not about De Shafilia. I did not know De Shafilia then, but you know, it's 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 my favorite chapter because you know I'm still friends with that person, very good friends with that person, mm -hmm. um, and because it it really illustrates how something dis that you think is a disaster, you know. Uh, that was really painful at the time. Like you look back on it now, and it is, it is hilarious. You know, yeah. 
Like yeah. just me with my head buried between a woman's legs, not even bothering to take my glasses off. I still have glasses <laughs> on. Shall I have glasses on trying to eat pussy? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? If you had told me you took your glasses off, I wouldn't have believed you. So I, I was like, well, I guess you got to see what she's doing in here. Like, so I'm, just, you know, like I'm just saying. And the thing is, when you told me that story when we were as friends, like when we were getting to know each other, I thought you were like 14. No, 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 no. You no. were a grown-ass man. A grown-ass man. Oh, my God. When I read that chapter and realized that, I was like, yeah. I almost called you, but it was late at night. Right. You could have called me. Yes, I was trying to perform four-eyed cunnilingus. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very tricky operation, the four-eyed cunnilingus. Um, oh, my gosh. Still, and I asked the person you know, in my life, like, can I write about this? And she was like, yeah, you were terrible. Um, but... You know, again, it's just one of those things, you know, you, you have to live long enough to to yeah. know that sometimes this thing that feels so tragic in the moment, you know, yeah, it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. So that's why it sticks out is like my favorite, my favorite chapter. Yeah. And, you know, um, one of my children read your book and I should preface this by saying that my children don't like most adults. But from day one, they've always loved you because you're not like other adults. adults. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. And, but what she said to me, she said, it, like it, it, she's it, like you broke her heart wide open. Like this, you know, she's not one to show a lot of feelings, and and but she felt affirmed and she felt open, and so your willingness to be vulnerable and honest on the page reaches people that way, including young people. And so I just got like, she sent me these, you know, text messages about how your book impacted her and it, it brought me to tears. And then I just thought yeah. so many young people are going to have that experience. So thank you um, as a mom um, I'm glad that, I'm glad for, going, that. for going there. Um, so I want you to think back to the day that you, um, press send on the first draft of the manuscript, sent it off to your editor, like completed first, like, you know, revisions and things would come, but that first step, how did you feel? And then how did you celebrate? Okay, wait, and we're talking about the last thing I sent off when it was done or when I first started? No, like you got a book deal and they said, you need to give us a draft by this date. Oh. And oh, yeah. Said, it was pretty much the same throughout. I mean, so I really don't know why I asked you to specify. I was just like, this is never this is never going to happen. Like, you know, I, I've always processed it in this way. Like, you know, you know, I'm always like hope for the best, like prepare for the worst you know, kind of person, which, you know, dulls my optimism, um, mm. you know. But I mean, I've used up all my optimism chemicals. I'm not optimistic about anything. It sucks. It's just, life is you, terrible. But, but you know how I feel about that. But you know, I think that it's a gradual process. Mm -hmm. Like it's a gradual process. You know, as days go by, you know, I do feel a, happier and, and more confident about um, you know the book. But I think throughout the entire process, I have just really been like, okay, this is great, but when's it all gonna, you know, when's the other shoe gonna drop? I'm just that kind of person. I'm like Eeyore, I'm Eeyore. I'm a horrible to be around. Like- um, You are not horrible to be around. <laughs> this is what it's like to be around you. It's like, you know, amusement park and like a great buffet. And then all of a sudden you're like, I gotta go. I have to go home right now. And it's like, I was just starting to enjoy you. Yeah, That's what it's like to be around you. I was from that kind of Linkus trauma. What? <laughs> anyway, I have to go right now before I just before four I'd kind of link us on this whole party. No, I mean I do have a I do have a window. I have a window yeah. where and I can like where I'm like social and I feel good, and then I have to like then I have to like pull back. Like you know I write about it. I'm like a, a an introvert who can do extroverted things, um, but it really just takes a lot of energy. Um, yeah. 
Well, with you, it's different. I hang out with you longer than most because, I mean, I think we know each other well enough that we're just like casual and and, and, and we talk about everything and it's a great, and you also make me food, which is amazing. Um, That's the only way I can get you to come to my house is to, I, I, you know, I figured this out, right? Yeah. You never so, come over unless I cook. Yeah. I mean, and I will continue in that vein. <laughs> There's like some rule, like I can't flip you off on these things, but just yeah. in my mind, I'm flipping you off right now. I just feel it. I can feel it. Um, okay. No, it's just, it's like, I do like, you know, I mean, you know, I'm a home buddy. I like to be at home. I like to be by myself the majority of the time. Like I, you know, but for people like yourself, whom I love dearly, you know, I do come out, you know, and if there's offers of food, that's also great. But I would, I want to let you know that I would come over without you i'm lying i'm lying <laughs> you couldn't even get it out you couldn't even get it out that's okay um is there anything you wanted to put in the book that didn't make it in there was stuff that i wanted to put in but we sort of figured it didn't it didn't fit um mm -hmm. you know there was a chapter about my experience at rehab um that it didn't it just didn't it just didn't fit with the vibe of the book or where the book was going um, mm -hmm. So that that one was pulled. Um, there was another uh, chapter uh, about a, a traumatic incident that I, you know, that was pulled, and I'm kind of glad it was pulled because um, uh, I don't know that I was really ready to reveal that. Um, so it wasn't, you know, and th and those stories, you know, now I mean they'll probably turn up somewhere else. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But, yeah, I, 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 you know, never throw anything away. So um, it too. wasn't like I really desperately wanted them in there. When they were taken out, I, I agreed with uh, Rakia, my editor, who was like, you know, they didn't. They're good stories, but they didn't. They didn't fit. And it was making the book like, you know, a tome, and and, and you know, it was just the right size at a, at a, at a, at a certain point. So yeah. Okay. Um. We touched on this kind of. Well, you told me what makes you uncomfortable. I guess what makes you happy. Nothing, nothing like I happiness is an elusive state that people seem to clamor for. I just know um, that life is not like that, um, you know, and people think I'm being like I'm performing this when I say this. I'm not a misanthrope, but, um, you know, I think happiness is a is, is a very sort of like furtive condition. It's ephemeral. Like I feel happiness sometimes. I feel mm -hmm. happiness when you cook me food. I you know, I feel happiness when, you know, my friends make me laugh, but I mean, generally happy. I mean, who really is? I don't believe people when they tell me they're happy. They're lying. <laughs> Everybody's miserable. <laughs> and, you know, and I wonder if like, there's a part of me that's a bit protective of you. And even though, like I said earlier, I feel like you can do anything. And so whenever you're anxious about things, I'm always like, you can do this. You got this. The one thing I, I did was hesitant about was when you're like, I'm going to be an academic. I'm going, you know, you saw yourself working in the academy and I know that academia is brutal. Yeah. I know, you know, well, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and so I just saw you, that's, that's the one area where I felt like you were kind of vulnerable and I, I was feeling a bit protective. Do you still aspire to teach now that you have taught? Is that what you, what you see yourself doing? I love teaching. Like I, you know, it's the one job, you know, I've had a lot of jobs. It's the one job that I actually really in, enjoy. Um, mm -hmm. And talking about writing, um, you know, with people who are writing is, is, you know, that's, I do feel happy in those moments when we're start, mm -hmm. when we're, when we start talking about like structure and character and, you know, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Those, um, so I really do like teaching. I want to continue to do it. Um, mm -hmm. I want to do it in the right environment, you know, but academia, you know, the one thing I thought that isn't true is that academia would be free of like politics and racism. And, you know, I've I naively thought that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I support that face you're making. right. You now. were sober when you thought this? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly not. But, you know, I have since learned that, you know, it's the same as it's the same as anywhere else. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but it's not like I'm going, you know, into a place that I hate and dealing with all that. 
yeah. I there is a part of the job that I actually really do love. Um, and teaching and talking about writing is it's you know it's a great deal of fun, and to be able to get paid for that is great. You know, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I do still plan on teaching. Okay, um, this question always kind of gets to me um, because when you're busy promoting a book like you're still trying to do all the things, but are you able to find time to read? And if so, what are you reading? I'm not able to find time to read. Like, um, I, you know, the thing about me is I can always find something to worry about. It's anxiety. You know, I can always mm -hmm. find something to worry about. And now with a lot of all this going on, you know, I, I'm having trouble like just relaxing. You know how it is when you just relax into a book and just let it take yeah. you. Know? Um, I'm having a hard time doing that because you know, I'll start thinking about as I'm reading, I'll start thinking about my book and, you know, what I haven't done or maybe what I should have done. So I think I just need some time um, mm -hmm. before I'm able to sit down and, and relax and, and, and actually just read for enjoyment again. Um, you know, there are a lot of books that are waiting for me um, and that I can't wait to read. Um, and I keep opening them and, and uh, you know, and not really being able to get into them. So I think I need a little bit of time. I need like, you know, a few weeks to just sit down and just do nothing but but read books. Yeah. Can you remember the last thing you read before your book? Uh, um, the was, World by Storm. <laughs> I'll try to say it again. It was Jumpa Lahiri's Interpreter of Malice. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I love that book. Um and I also read um um something uh Stealing Buddha's Dinner. Mm -hmm. Um I started Isabel Wilkerson's cast and I didn't I didn't get to finish it. I started Kiese's book and then I got mad at Kiese for being so good. I, I was like, I can't read this while I'm writing a book. I can't, I can't do Heavy? it. Heavy, you mean his memoir? Yeah. Okay. I was so I was ooh, I was swollen. We <laughs> talked about this the other night. I was swollen. I was like, how dare he? How have a life dare. and write about it. Yeah, how dare this man write a book? But, you know, I mean, he and I talked about how that's, it comes from this weird place of like scarcity and like, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, and all those sort of negative things. So I really want to get back into it. But like the things that he was doing in that book, I was just, I was, I was swept away. Like, mm -hmm. and then I just decided like, I can't, I got afraid that I would unintentionally steal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was like, okay, I can't, I can't. Do this. I'm putting. I'm putting it aside because I really, I really want to get into it and enjoy it. But what I read of it, I was, I was knee deep. I was like so, so taken with it. Beautiful. Yeah. You know, I was. I thought about you and your mom uh, recently because this summer I'm going to be teaching Kiese's book, and um, in a workshop on epistolary writing. Yeah. And um, we're going to be teaching. We're going to be teaching parallel, the not together, but but parallel. Oh, yeah. I um, hope they clear the parking lot for the fight. Oh, it's the rumble in on in Eden Hall. I'm gonna grab them earrings. That's how I'm gonna do it. <laughs> Just violent for no reason. Anyway, so I was, you know, preparing um, my workshop. I know you haven't started preparing your workshop, but I was preparing my workshop, and um, I decided to use uh, on Kiese's blog. His mother wrote a response to him, a letter back. And so I wonder if you, like if your mother ever wanted to respond, would you ever ask her to write to you? Hell no. <laughs> I don't know how I can put this any more pointedly. Uh, fuck hell to the fuck no. Um, well, you wouldn't have to publish it like he did, but if just giving her an opportunity to reflect yeah. on the book and, you know, and she's shy. And so talking yeah. to you might be difficult, but, and I'm not being prescriptive. I'm just curious. Like, right. is that something you'd be interested in? No. Okay. <laughs> of course you, you know, would. I mean, I say no with, I say no with, with, you know, uh, succinctly because I just know that she would never, she would never do that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I know that we are going to talk about it when we have a moment alone together. You know, mm -hmm. we haven't had that opportunity yet. Um, um, 
But if she wanted to, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I would, I would love to read something like that if she were to write me a response letter. Like, you know, one of the things that really saddened me about um, the book is that at some point when I was talking to my mother about it over the phone, because we haven't seen each other, you know, in a year, um, is that she said that she was sorry. And mm. you know, I mean, about some of the things that happened and we didn't she didn't get specific and she but she said you know she was talking to my sister and and she was telling my sister like how she felt sorry and that is like that's the last thing mm -hmm. that i wanted to come of this you know mm -hmm. um you know she is a is a hero in in my book um and in my book metaphorically and, and, yes. and literally <laughs> you know um and that's it's like the last thing i want her to feel out of this like look i'm here like look you know I'm, I, you know, she grab. I, I keep going into my bag, paying for nice hotel rooms to show her that, like, you know, it's not. This is if it weren't for my experiences, you know, I wouldn't be who I am, and there would be no book, and there would be no, there would be no this time in our lives where we're, you know, getting to know each other, and that I start seeing you not just as my mother, but as a whole woman, as a, as a person who was a little girl, as a person who was yeah. adolescent, you know. So, you know, if she wanted to respond to me, I would welcome it. I just know that, be, you know, I've been knowing her for a while now. And yeah. I just think that, that would never, never come to mind you know, for yeah. her. And you answered my second question or my follow up question to that. Um, and I love that you said she's she's a hero, you know, and and that's who our mothers are. They're flawed heroes. Absolutely. And uh, the last time. Kiese was in Pittsburgh. He was speaking in uh, 2019, and I asked him a question at an event. Um, you know, what do we owe our mothers? And you said what he said, which is to see them as something other than our mothers. Um, yeah. Is that do you do you believe that? Do we owe them anything else? Apparently, really nice hotel rooms. Uh <laughs> My mother Kate was coming to visit. She was like, "I don't want no rickety ass hotel room." This is what she said to me. Uh, yeah. I, was, I was like, "Well, do you want me to pay for it?" She was like, "She was like, this is where I want to stay." And I was like, "Um, do you want me to pay for it?" And she was like, "Oh, I, yes. I don't want to block your blessing." <laughs> <laughs> so we know where you get your humor from. <laughs> oh yeah, she's hilarious. She's hilarious. But do I think I owe her anything else? You know, I say. <laughs> You know, in the in the acknowledgments at the end of my book, it's, I say, you know, to my mother, I think, and I put it like, you know, to whom I owe everything, like literally, you know. And the thing about that is, she doesn't want everything. You know, the one thing that she wants is for me to chase after this elusive fantasy called happiness. Um, but, you know, I, I, I would, you know, obviously anything for my mother. Well, she's she's sacrificed and she has fought for me like her whole life. I mean, what do you, what don't I owe her? You know. So I will end with this question, and then we'll go to questions in the question box. You are a terrible cook. Yes. What's the least terrible thing you make? reservations for a restaurant. <laughs> you were cooking in the pandemic. You were sending me some pictures. Things were looking almost edible. No, they weren't. Don't lie. Dude. You don't have to no, lie. Really, I was like, oh, wait. I did say a nice thing about, I don't know what it was, but. You said it looks almost edible. That's what you said. That's right. Nice that was, and so that's progress. That's pro What yeah. was that? I don't, it might have been a salad. I don't know no. because. I mean, you've just given, you've taken away any confidence that I've ever had around like culinary stuff. So. No, that's not true. I helped you diagnose the issue. Do you remember what I said? No. See, what I said was, I said, you could cook well. You're just impatient and you have to be patient and you have no patience. I figured that out within like days of knowing you. Really? I don't really have a whole lot of patience. Yeah. Uh, but I think, yeah, I get I don't know why my cooking is so bad, um, but I, do, I have made it one of my goals to make something for you, to cook okay. something for you. Look at your face right now. You can't even you, <laughs> look. You can't even look at me. Look at you. Look at yourself. Um, <laughs> is to learn how to make something really well. Did I cook okay. for you? 
Did you eat something of mine or are you just I've never eaten anything you've ever cooked? Because it ever. doesn't look edible to you. It doesn't look good. I remember, yeah, you don't you won't even let me help, but which is fine with me because I'll eat your food all day. I won't have I don't have to help, but I do have it on my bucket list that okay. to make a meal for Disha, like not just a dish, like a full meal. Like I'm talking okay. like appetizer, you know, uh entree dessert uh that you like. Okay. So that's what I was kind of doing over the pandemic and why I was sending why I was sending you pictures of things because I was you know, it was like works in progress that one day I'm going to make you eat in front of me. And, the, and there was progress. So thank you. I'm looking yeah. forward to that. That's that's genuine. It, that part is genuine. I am looking forward to it. The pandemic changed me. I, I want new experiences. I wanted oh, adventures. And so eating your food would be an adventure. Yeah, I mean, eating my food would be a new experience for you because <laughs> that experience would be death. <laughs> so okay. We you'll get to see Jesus. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we have a question here. Um, Veronica asks, you spoke about not really being optimistic while writing your book. What has this experience been for you now since the book has come out, along with the amazing reviews and love from those who have read it? In other words, now what are you going to worry about? Oh, the next one. Ah. The next one. <laughs> I'm, which I, which I, you know, I'm trying to like figure out right now. Now what I'm, that's what I'm going to worry about next. But now, don't don't. I mean, please don't get me wrong. I really appreciate you know all the the nice things that people have said and that the, the the book is getting recognition, you know. But my personality is just not a jump up and down personality. I'm like you know I appreciate it. That's really nice, you know. Um, what's what's next? Like what what work do I have to do now? Like I just am like just do the work and enjoy it. While you're doing it, like I'm enjoying this immensely. I I have enjoyed the other talks that I've done immensely. I enjoy teaching. I enjoy talking about writing. But you know, I don't think you'll ever catch me doing like backflips. What's something other than writing a book that you see in your future? Only fans. <laughs> So somebody was saying we could get like we could have like OnlyFans accounts and we would just read to people. That would be on hot. OnlyFans accounts. But that's not why I'm going on OnlyFans. If I'm going to read to people on OnlyFans, I'm going to be butt naked. Um, <laughs> not me. Just yeah. every. Just Towards the best managing of time, expectations. The worst of times. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, what do I? What do, besides writing books? Like writing is really. You know that that you know what I chase now. You know when you're writing and you're just you you just start out by maybe tinkering with a few sentences, yeah, and then and then before you know it, you're just deep in it, mm -hmm. like and then you lose time, like that's what I'm looking for again, you know. Yeah. Um, but as far as other things, you know, I guess teaching, like my own, I think my only fanship has sailed. I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, we have to talk. You would be surprised what's and who's on OnlyFans. But anyway, that's for another time. I know, that's for off camera. Um, <laughs> what else do I see myself doing? Like, I really just like want what I, I mean, in terms of what I want, I just want, uh, you know, a garden. Um, I want to write. Um, and that really, my needs are very, very simple, you know. Um, and I'd like to travel again. You know, that would be that would be great. Yeah. And we talked about living me, you and Yona having a house and living together. I couldn't live with you and Yona. That would be the worst. Like three. Remember three's company? <laughs> that would be the worst. It'd be like three's ratchet. It would be terrible. <laughs> it was terrible, horrible because you and Yona are nice and like, you know, you're you're very I mean, I hate to gender it, but you're very like female in the way that you live it's very nice at your homes and like it's very clean and like i'm a i'm a tornado of a human person like i don't know i mean we could try it but i i'm pretty sure somebody's gonna end up dead oh gosh yeah well <laughs> i think i'm gonna try it that would be a fun reality show so like i said the pandemic changed me there are things that like pre-pandemic i'm like never like i would never live with you pre-pandemic mm -hmm. but 
after the pandemic, I think it would be fun. I don't know, Disha. Like, <laughs> I think if you think about living with me after the pandemic, you should get another vaccine. Child. Clearly, I have not been. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, you have not, you have been affected by the pandemic. <laughs> okay, we have a question from Janae. I hope I said that right. I was recently reading an interview where Sonia Sanchez told her students, we don't destroy people in this classroom. What are some words or a vision which drives you in teaching, whether you express it or not? Oh gosh, that's a rough, that's a tough question. Like, you know, I, you know, I, I teach a lot of memoir um, and I think the thing that I really push is like, you know, you know, with, without being too pushy is like really put yourself on the page. Like, you know, don't, you know, don't try to be the hero of your story because, yeah. you know, um, that, I mean, it, it doesn't feel realistic to me. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, the thing that I also try to push is like, you know, you are trying to tell a story to somebody you can't see, you know? So mm -hmm. like, you, you know, you're telling a story to a wall and you can't gauge the wall's reaction. You can't mm -hmm. see the wall's facial expressions. Like, you know, so dig dig around everywhere for that feeling that you want to express, you know, try different ways, try different uh, structures, try different ways of organizing a sentence, use different words, get a thesaurus, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I just want people, I just want, I think, writers that I teach to be as creative as they want and to say whatever they want, you know, um, mm -hmm. without restriction. So, you know, it's a hard thing to do because, you know, I teach younger people oftentimes and they've been taught, you know, the, the five paragraph essay, you know, or the four yeah. paragraph essay. And you can't, it's hard to crack through that. But I, I love to see that moment of realization when they're like, I can do anything I want. Like, yes, yeah. absolutely. You know. Um, so yeah, I just want a little, I want freedom in the classroom and I want to, you to express yourself. Um, let's see. Oh, we have another question. Keep it coming. The book has only been out a few days, but what's been your favorite part so far? What happened that was unexpected for you? Mm. Well, I mean, I think the, you know, and this sounds disingenuous, but it's true. I think the fact that people are paying attention to the book at all is pretty um, unexpected for me. Um, I what has been the most unexpected thing? Um, can I be honest? Please. Uh, that bag. The check cleared. <laughs> Fenty for all. <laughs> Fenty and Coco Van for my friends. Like, you know, I think that, I don't know. I, I don't know that there's been any one specific moment that's been, you know, like a watershed moment. The entire process for me has been, you know, a, a, a great, you know, um, meeting new people. Like I was learning all kinds of things like uh, in the creation of this book. I didn't know what an arc was I didn't, or a galley was. I didn't know what a blurb was. Like Rakia was like, so-and-so is going to blurb your book. And I was like, what? I was like, oh, that's great. You know, and then I'd be like, well, I don't know what the fuck she's talking about. You know, and then they would use these terms that like I didn't know and I would just pretend that I knew them. I didn't know that there was a book before the book. I didn't know that, you know, I didn't know anything about, you know, publicity. I still don't. Um, you know, so this whole experience, like the next book won't be this experience, right? Because I'll yeah. know it, I'll know what's coming, you know? Yeah. Um, so I really do, this, despite the fact that I, I sound like Eeyore, I really do relish this time in my life because this is the, you know, the first time. It's like, you know, the first time I had sex, but not as messy. <laughs> You know, there's thankfully, all these. Like, thankfully, yeah, this there's process. All these, there's all these firsts, and you know, and every time I learn something new, I'm very, very grateful. I I got to do an audiobook. I didn't know um, what that was like at all. I didn't know what to expect. I was I was I was afraid, and I went in there, and um, I found out that you can you can mess up. I did, I thought you had to do it like all in one take. 
Oh, I no, editing. Yeah, I literally thought like, oh my God, I'm going to have to go in and read Deep breath and just. <laughs> like the whole book, like a damn opera. Like it was ridiculous. And like the director was like, you can stop, you know, you can stop and take a breath and you can mess up and just start. I'm not, I was amazed, blown away, you know? Yeah. So this is how little I knew going into this process. And again, you know, the next book won't, it won't feel this way. So I do, yeah. I'm, I'm smart enough to recognize that, um, you know, this is a special time in my life. Yeah. And you deserve all of it. Um, so what other music did you listen to while writing the book? Oh my gosh. Uh, there's an article up on Lar a large hearted boy, um, uh, that, that has some of the music that I listened to. Um, but it was, I was all over the place. Like, um oh gosh i can't even remember now like it depends on what mood i wanted to be in a lot of donna summer um a lot of like goth music from like the 80s like skinny puppy mm -hmm. uh, i listened to ooh helen reddy i am woman i don't know why i do not know <laughs> i was about to say <laughs> Was that like I, your mom's favorite song or something? No, I just for some reason I felt a little like a little bit of Helen Reddy. Anne Murray. Okay. I listened to some Anne Murray. Um I listened to some old 90s R and B. Um uh uh, uh SWV. Mm -hmm. um, just a, it was a, it was really all over the place, you know. And I would listen to different music, like if there was a sentence that wouldn't come to me, like mm -hmm. I would listen to a whole song just to get the feeling that would have that would evoke that one sentence. So it was a lot. One day, maybe that'll be my next thing. I'm just going to put out a, a three CD set of music I listened to while um, yes. writing this book. Well, now you got me thinking. I'm going to start listening to music again. I I have this weird relationship with it because it makes me sad. Because whatever the song, I'll think about something. It'll make me think about like my mom or something from the past. And so, but. Years ago, I used to write to music all the time, so I'm, I might try that again. And just in case anybody missed it, Large Hearted Boy is a site that has author playlists. Um, Brian has a playlist there. I have a playlist there. And lots of our friends and favorite writers have playlists at Large Hearted Boy. Um, and I love Meg's question. And usually when I interview people, I ask this first, but I guess I didn't ask you, how are you? Uh, you know. <laughs> Maybe that's why I didn't ask. <laughs> I knew. No, no. I mean, I'm all right. I mean, I come on. I mean, this is this is a great time in my life. I would be, you know, remiss if I if well, I didn't. Now here's the thing that I don't want you to do because I I I did not yield to this pressure. Hmm. Just because you have a book and it's doing well you don't have to just always say like, you feel great. Cause I would always yeah. say it's like, it's a mixed bag. Yeah. I am happy Absolutely. that this is and, and thankful. And there are, you know, people dying. There's a yeah. pandemic still yeah. happening that, you know, police right. are still killing, like all of these things can be true at once. Yeah. And then we don't have to perform. Okay. If we're, if yeah. we're really not, or we're okay. And right. Also, you know, that's exactly right. I thank you for saying that because I mean, you know, I mean, I think I, I say in the book, I, I do have, uh, I, I struggle with depression and anxiety. Um, those things don't go away because you put a book into the world. That's right. You know, there are days when I am, you know, I'm like, you know, there's a light in, you know, uh, on the horizon, like, oh, I have this book in the world and it's doing well and people like it. But at the same time, I'm like, you know, I really don't, you know, um, I, I'm down today or I'm anxious today, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's why, uh, you know, my reality is one where happiness comes along, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I am not in a state of happiness, you know, yeah. I'm happy about certain things. I'm loving the, um, that people are, are, are um, uh, accepting the book and, and taking to it. But at the same time, like you said, it's a mixed bag, you know, it's a mixed bag. Last quick question <laughs> process. Do you write every day? Do you use uh, writing exercises? You have a routine? No. <laughs> Neither do I. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I was fitting a lie. I was fitting a lie. Um, no, I <laughs> no, I don't. Like I, and I wish I did because I feel like things would get done a lot quicker. But um, I 
I, I don't write until I just can't not write. You know, that's, you know, I have today, I have something that I, that has just started like a seed was planted. I want to write um, something so bad, like, and then, you know, you push it to the back, like, oh, you know, I'll get to it later, but I know what's going to happen. I know what happens with me. It'll grow and grow and grow until it is all I can think about. And then yeah. I'll write. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's usually how it happens with me. Um, you know, writing the book was different because, you know, there was lots of things growing and, 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 um, you know, and also there were deadlines. There were, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. but when I'm left to my own devices, you know, um, you know, like this story, I mean, I'm thinking about it right now. It just has to be written. And I know that in three days, it's, it's all I'm going to want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I love you, Disha. I do. I love you, Brian. You give me hell. And I will continue to give you hell. Yeah. Don't forget about my mom as much. Your mom lunch Saturday, May twenty second. I will be there wherever you tell me to be. The wrong ass date. Never mind. We'll talk about it later. May 29th. May 29th. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm not gonna let your mom down. I'll let you down. I'm not gonna. Let you down. <laughs> Do not let mom down because she baked you a whole sweet potato pie. She did. She oh. did. She did. Well, she I could just be like my say. honorary mother in law. I just don't have to marry him, but she could still be my mother in law. Mother in law. I mean, you could be my mother. Y'all are basically married. Um, after this God. conversation, you know, <laughs> just be gay married. Gay <laughs> married. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We can see thank your comments. You thank you. Yes. Thank y'all so much for this very generous conversation. Um, it really was wonderful. If y'all have not bought the book yet, please hit the till button at the bottom middle screen buy it and uh this video will be up on our youtube channel so you can visit whenever you want and you can also come back to the chat to see the resources from the librarian thank you all for a great night thank brian disha y'all are incredible thank you love you right, too and cheris cheris thank you cheris thank you all good night